Are you ready for part two? Last week we did part one of our reptile house tour, which was the main reptile room in our house, and today we're going to be showing you the rest of our reptiles. We're just going to start right here, so just, that's where we are right now. Uh, on, on this table, in this 10 gallon tank, is our adorable little larval tiger salamander. He looks very similar to an axolotl, but he's not an axolotl. He is in fact a salamander. He just, for some reason, refuses to morph into an adult, and we don't really know why. It's been about four years since we inherited him after his um, owner suddenly passed away, and we don't know where his owner got him, other than it was somewhere in Wisconsin. And there's some isolated populations of the tiger salamander that stays in larval form, or just random individuals that don't morph into adults. And we're thinking that's got to be one of those that just refuses to change. He doesn't want to grow up. As you can see, even though we actually just cleaned his tank about a week ago, uh, he has perma-algae that has just <laughs> permanently affixed itself to the decor in his tank, but that's okay. He doesn't mind. If anything, the algae kind of absorbs waste, you know? And I'm actually going to feed him. We give him sinking pellets because he seems to be scared of anything live. I've tried live worms and minnows. The only tough part is I have to drop them so that the current carries it in front of his face. Oh, Aw, really? It was right there, dude. How about this one? Get it. Yeah, all right. And then he'll just forage and find the others. <laughs> and I think we're going to turn off his air pump just so that it's, it might be causing some noise in the background. So we'll just turn it off. Next to the salamander is our adorable little baby false chameleon. We won't really cover her at all though in this video because we literally just a few days ago posted a video all about her. So if you want to meet her, uh, watch this video. It's all about this baby. So instead we're going to just move right along to I think one of the biggest fan favorites on this channel, which is Nearly Headless Nick. Look at that! Look, he shed! Wow! That's a complete shed, too. Man, look at that! He even shed his face! Guys, he's getting so good at shedding nowadays. He looks great, too. That was a good shed. Some Sometimes he sheds completely, sometimes he needs my help, but this time he was able to do it, and he got, uh, looks like all the shed off of his face, too. If you don't know of Nick's story, he was about two years ago now hit by a lawnmower, is what we think happened anyway. He was actually found by a young boy and his mother, and not young, he was like a teenager. They took him in and gave him kind of a safe place to peacefully pass away because the lawnmower had shaved off one of his eyes, and it caused serious damage to this poor snake, but instead of dying, this snake not only survived, but he healed up as best as he could, and he survived with only one eye, but that remaining eye was very swollen and risked rupturing. We got this guy, they gave him to us about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and we ended up bringing him to the vet to have that eye removed before it burst and became a bigger problem than it already was. He's made a full recovery other than the fact that he has no eyes now and has a little sideways tongue flick, but he's now a permanent part of our family. He is a trooper. We have been debating when we want to put him downstairs and introduce him to our other male garter snake, but we haven't done it yet because now it's breeding season and we have our male paired with the ladies at the moment, so we're going to wait until pairing season is over and then we're finally going to introduce him to another garter snake. It's going to be nerve-wracking, but We've just got to do it and hope that they get along. They're a social species. This is one of the only species of snakes that you can cohab with another individual, but I think they're going to be just fine. Well, we're going to put him back in his habitat. This is a smaller enclosure than what I'd recommend for this size of garter snake, and that's because he is, in fact, blind. I mean, he has no eyes. So we have things um, a little closer to each other in the smaller habitat so he can learn where everything is. And he has actually learned. He poops in this corner and he poops in that corner. He uses his humidity box when he's getting ready to shed. He knows where his water is and his favorite cave. Usually he's curled up in one of these front sections, but he seems to be doing really well in it, although we are planning on moving him with that other male here relatively soon, just after the pairing season's done. Now we're going to move over to this room and check out the reptiles over here. We have, let's start with our Lechianus gecko. Oh, she's in her favorite spot. Can you find her? I'll give you a few seconds to try to find the lychee. She is underneath her favorite plant. Come here, little girl. Hi, can you come here? There she is. What a pretty lychee. 
Hi, cutie. This is the largest species of gecko. They are native to New Caledonia, and this is an adult size for this particular locale. But there are some, like, uh, what is it, the Grand Turk? No. Uh, I can't remember. There's another locale that grows to be uh, considerably larger than she is, and that's the type of lychee I would love someday. But I really love this little pajama gecko. She just eats a powdered diet. We kind of switch up the different the brands that we use because we're still debating on which one to permanently use. But the powdered diet is this is last night's meal that she it looks like you didn't eat your food last night, girl. But you just mix it with water uh, into like kind of a pancake batter consistency and leave it in their enclosure overnight. And if they're hungry, they come over and they lick it up. So really easy to feed. Another thing I love about this species of gecko is that they don't need UVB or any additional heat source, assuming your house doesn't get, you know, above 75 degrees or so. So you just leave them at room temperature, give them some things to climb on. She loves her cork bark tube. And we only have a, an LED light above just to make it a little easier for us to see her and to give her a little bit of a day and night light cycle. Where are you going? They are leapers. Is she gonna take off? Mm. And although their feet, like their toe pads feel sticky, like legit they feel sticky, but there's no suction cups involved. It's just a matter of microscopic hairs that they can use to create an electromagnetic bond to the surface that they are sticking to. Really cool adaptation that these geckos have, and we actually made an entire video all about how geckos can stick to walls that you can watch it. The thumbnail looks like this. We're gonna put her back. I know it's not where your plant is, but you can, yeah, okay. She's gonna go right back to where she was. Right next to the Lichianus gecko's enclosure would be our big enclosure for our Cuban false chameleons. Now we just did a video, again, on the Cuban false chameleons. We showed you the adults that we have and the baby. We did leave out one individual and that was this girl because about a month after we got this breeding group, uh, this third female developed some sort of neurological issue. So we've been giving her some TLC and she, she eats as long as I assist feed her. Like if I put the bug in her mouth, then she chomps it up and eats it. But she has some balance issues. So I've been treating her with some antibiotics or some various medicines and I can't seem to get her to turn around. So I think she was a wild caught lizard that just didn't acclimate very well to captivity. But we're still trying, we're not giving up. We have her own platform over here just for her to have something wider to sit on. And we're really just hoping for the best. But thankfully, the other three are doing fantastic. Although I'm not gonna take them out because again, we just did a video on these lizards. But that's where their enclosure is. And then on the other side of the room is, the, not a reptile, but this is our fish tank. I really like our fish tank. Oh, the gross. There's some algae on the front. I should have wiped that down. That's okay. We have all sorts of barbs. I really like semi-aggressive fish. These red ones here, which are very active and very excited, always begging for food, are sunburst mutation rosy barbs. The gold ones are neon gold mutation gold barbs. There's also some Dennis's, uh, Dennison's barbs, also known as Rosaline sharks or Rosaline sharks. Here is the royal pleco that we have. It's all live plants and driftwood. Um, try to make kind of a little ecosystem with this tank and yeah it's a lot of fun it's really entertaining just to sit and watch all the fish all right back to reptiles let's go downstairs all right guys this is a species that we've never shown you before on the channel but we've had them for a couple of years we just really haven't found a video to give them yet inside of this enclosure is a group of Timor monitors they're native to the Timor Islands well that's how you pronounce the islands so that's how we pronounce the lizard species. They're, I know some people call them Timur monitors, but we like Timor. This is a species of dwarf monitor, so they actually don't get very large. This is, they have a little bit of growing still to do, but they don't get anywhere near like a savanna monitor or something. They're kind of skittish, as you can see, but I think with regular hand handling, they would calm down. This is just a group that we have together, um, just, I guess, for display purposes. We don't handle them a whole lot. They are carnivores, so we feed them a variety of insects. They'll eat just about any insect. They'll get uh, raw chicken occasionally. Sometimes they get fish. We give them canned, grain-free dog food sometimes. They eat just about anything. They don't really care. You're sure, now you're calm. Maybe eventually I'll have to do a video about these guys. Yeah, one more. Yeah. The right video. Yeah. Show off all three of them. Yeah, the other two, I don't know where they are. But they're in a 55-gallon tank with all sorts of things to climb on. They spend a lot of their time up on this basking platform that Ed built specifically for them. All right, we're gonna put you back. Again, we'll do a video more in depth on them. 
at some point. All right, let's move on. Next to the Timor monitors are our two garter snake enclosures. In this 40 gallon, we have several girls together. Um, let me pull one out for you. Up top here is Twiggy. She is just a common garter snake. Oh, the one that you see all the time up here in the Midwest, but normally they're very quick moving and they just have a lot of energy basically. But this one, surprisingly, was very friendly right from the beginning. She came from some guy's basement and he wanted to kill her because he was scared of her. So we took her instead and she was pretty much this friendly right from the get-go. So she has been an amazing ambassador animal and she even eats in front of crowds or in front of the audience, which is a plus. Also in this enclosure would be, let's see, oh, this is the first California red-sided we got. She has more blue than red, but the blues are just stunning. She's a beautiful snake, and she's calmed down dramatically since we put her with other garter snakes, and we've seen that happen quite a bit. She was quite wild when we first got her, but we're hoping to breed her in the future, although we can't right now because we don't have a male that is breeding size. All of our male California red-sided garters are still babies, so she's going to have to wait probably two years still before we can finally breed her. So I'll set her back and there's one more that I want to show you in here because the really pretty red-sided garter is unfortunately not very handleable unless I want to smell like musk for the rest of the day. Here is the last one I'll show you in this tank. It's actually that there's four in here. This is Prius. She is our hybrid garter snake. She is half Eastern Plains garter snake and half ribbon snake. The, she was born at a zoo, but she was an oops litter. The zoo had two individuals together, one Eastern Plains garter and one ribbon snake that they thought were both males or both females, but then they had babies one day and she was part of that clutch. She is also one of our educational animals. She's a really unique looking garter because of the hybrid that she is. And although I normally bring her to programs, I'm not right now because in case you haven't already noticed, she is gravid. Look at the scale spread, which is the spread in between the scales here. You can really see the skin in between them. That's called scale spread. It's either a sign of an obese snake, or in this case, it's a sign of a gravid snake or pregnant snake. Garter snakes are viviparous, meaning they don't lay eggs. They just give live birth. So one day we'll just see a bunch of baby garters slithering around. Last year, she uh, had an accidental litter or clutch for us where we put a, our, our albino checker garter snake in here in this enclosure and I forgot to take her out in time and after a couple days when I realized it, it was too late. However, the babies, their hybrid babies, were gorgeous. They're some of the prettiest garter snakes I've ever seen. Here's some footage from part one of the tour where I'm showing off one of her babies. This is one of our holdbacks. And it's just prettier with each shed. And not only were the babies pretty, but her baby hybrids were better eaters than the albino checkers that we produced, and they were calmer and more handleable than the albinos, making them amazing pet quality snakes. Like, great, especially for a first pet snake. Her babies were just amazing. So we did decide to pair her up with that checkered male again. And I know a lot of people are anti-hybrid, but we are selling their babies as either singles or in same-sex pairs. And I think the big issue people have with hybrid snakes is that there's confusion as to what their lineage is because they're li the buyer is lied to on what type of snake they're actually purchasing. And we are being 100% transparent and they, yes, she will be having hybrid babies. However, they are some of the best pet quality garter snakes I've ever seen, which is why we decided to produce them again. In this enclosure, we have our three albino checkered garters together. Some are more handleable than others. This one isn't too bad. This, this albino female has a beautiful yellow yellow dorsal stripe running down her back. That's the male. He is in breeding mode right now. That's why we actually have him in with these two ladies paired up. And that is Fatness Everdeen. She's the mom of last year's albino checkered garters. On the other side of the room is our stack of big enclosures for our bigger snakes. I guess we'll just start from the top down. Oh, you're fine, buddy. Calm down. This is Loki. He is an exanthic black-tailed Kribo. These are incredible snakes. They're very active. They're very strong. He's so muscular. It's just crazy. And uh, he's a great eater. He is voracious. He would eat every day if I let him. But he, for us, eats about once a week. A uh, decent sized rat, and it seems to be maintaining a good body weight on him. This beautiful snake was actually given to us by a fan. Kristen, if you're watching this, Loki's doing amazing. He is a fantastic snake. He is uh, a little bit skittish, but not too bad. He just moves around a lot, I think. He's not bitey. 
Um, he's, yeah, he just has a lot of energy, which is fun. Oh, I, I love you too. We would love to eventually find him a female uh, for the future breeding project. Uh, preferably an exanthic mutation female, just like he is. Oh man, Loki. Hi, let's okay. go. Go that way. Yeah, or we may have to do a het exanthic since they're a little bit less expensive than a visual exanthic. But he is just so pretty. This snake is normally, now exanthic mutation kind of gets you a grayscale looking variety of that snake, so he is a bit more gray than what they look like in the wild. We're going to put your cave back since I had to take that out to get you out. Oh, hi. Hi. Now this cage, although it's a decent size, I'd still like a bigger enclosure for him, so we have a surprise coming on the channel later. I don't want to give it away, but we have something big on the way. Before I <laughs> spill the beans on it, we're just going to move down to the next enclosure. This is one of Ed's snakes. This is a one of our retics, actually. Basically, I'm using the hook because he has a very strong food response. This is a titanium tiger mutation reticulated python. And he is so beefy, but he is, how old is he? Three years old now? Close to three. About three years old. Uh, we recently saw a picture of his sister, and she's like three times his size. And he could be larger if we wanted to feed him more, but we honestly don't want to power feed him just so he can breed sooner. So he, um, we're just kind of letting him grow at a normal rate. Power feeding isn't the best thing for the health of your snakes. It may make them grow faster, but it cuts down their lifespan considerably. So uh, we'd rather him have a full lifespan, even though that means we won't be able to breed him as quickly. But that's okay, it's been a lot of fun watching him grow. We feed him a frozen thawed rat, a colossal rat, every other week. If you've never held a reticulated python, uh, you don't hang on to them, they hang on to you. They are grippers. This snake, along with Doug and the other retic down there, which we'll get to later, have actually all been in music videos before. They've they've done acting. Yeah, you're an actor, aren't you? I'll put a link to the music video that they're in in the description below. This is one of the enclosures that Ed built. He did a good job. Good job, Ed. Thank you. Yeah, you built all four of these. So we have Loki on top. This is Murdoch, the reticulated python. In here is Doug, my boa constrictor. Oh, you urated. Really? Get a boa, they said. It'll be fun, they said. I fed him three days ago, so I've actually just been leaving him completely alone the last, since I fed him. You can still so see was the a, bulge. Oh man, yeah, you can still see the meal in there. This was a rabbit right here, and uh, it was a decent sized rabbit too. This guy's really good at, he never regurges, so I'm not too worried about holding him even though I can still see his food there. To feed this big guy, who's just a big gentle giant by the way, we actually know people who breed rats, rabbits, and guinea pigs, and whenever they have one that dies of natural causes, they freeze it, give it to us, and then when we need to feed him, we just thaw it and recycle the bodies with him. So we actually don't kill any animal to feed this snake, everything is recycled, which makes me feel better, because it's like, well, then their body isn't wasted, you know. Doug is a seven and a half foot boa constrictor, just a common boa, a BCI. He has no red tail, as you can see. He's not a red tailed boa, but he is super gentle. He joins me at all of my programs. He goes with me everywhere. I bring him to libraries and scouts and birthday parties, and he is so tolerant of handling, which makes him such a great ambassador snake. Doug is 14 years old, but they can live anywhere from 20 to even upwards of 30. I heard of a boa constrictor that lived 40 years once, so we should still have plenty of time with this big guy. Your papers are changed. Time to go back. Sweet! All right, two bins left, or two enclosures left on this level of the house. Looks like you just shed. We're gonna pull that out. Oh gosh, it's holding water. These are our false water cobras. Come here, buddy. Hi! I know you're probably hungry because you just shed. I'm not feeding you right now. This is Roger. Their scientific name is Hydrodynastes gigas, and with their common name being false water cobra, it actually tells you a little bit about the snake. Water, meaning that they actually do live near the water in South America. And as you can see, they hood up like a cobra. That's where they get the false water cobra um, part of their name from, because they're not tr a true species of cobra. There we go, we can kind of see it there. They hood up when they're excited, or I've noticed he does it if he's eating and he sees me walking by and he's trying to like scare me away. But it is their defense mechanism is just mimicking cobras. Uh, his girlfriend is notorious for pooping whenever we take her out. Jace, if you're watching this, 
I'm sorry if she pooped all over your pants that one time. But this is the female. She is about eight feet long, which is the max size for the false water cobra. They're also known as the Brazilian smooth snake because if you look at their scales, they don't have any keels on their scales. A keeled scale is a scale that has a raised ridge down the center of it. These do not have keels. They're completely smooth, so it makes for a very smooth textured snake. But a lot of snakes that are native to North America, like the hognose snake, bull snake, fox snakes, they all have keels, so that's why they feel so rough in comparison. Since they're more of a tropical species, we keep these on uh, more of a tropical soil. They're actually on a coconut bedding uh, type substrate. And actually, all now that I think about it, all the snakes in this entire stack, except for Doug, are on a tropical soil just to keep humidity levels up. And Doug is on newspaper because he doesn't necessarily need the high humidity, and the newspaper makes for really easy cleaning with his big dumps. We also give this species a large water dish big enough to bathe in. Of course, he's not going to want to go in right now. Oh, you get, no, nope. keeps changing his mind. Well, you know, I'm just going to put you in back and you can make up your mind later. This is Ed's other reticulated python. There we go. All right, you big girl. We've been handling this girl since she was a baby. That's why I completely trust her. She's a very friendly snake. Of course, they are still wild animals. They are not domesticated, so we are careful when we are holding her. And when she gets bigger, we'll be making sure there's at least two of us in the room when we do take her out for handling or even just for feeding. Even now we do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Even now we still, just to be safe, we make sure there's two people in the room. We bought this big lady as a tiger golden child mutation. And the golden child gives you that reduced pattern down their back. Instead, they kind of have this really pretty speckling effect down their back. She kind of... Um, is iridescent in the right light. You kind of see a rainbow of colors on her. Man, you are just so muscular. I can't, every time I hold her, I just mm -hmm. can't get over it. Is your arm length six feet? Yeah, it's the same height. Same oh, as your it? height, yeah. So I'd probably push, probably 10. About 10. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably close to 10 feet. So currently she's the longest snake that we do have. She's not the heaviest. I'd still say that Doug is heavier than she is, but that could be because he just ate a rabbit. I don't know. Yeah. But they're, they're pretty close, and she will eventually take that first seat as being the biggest snake in our house. We feed Noodle here just as frequently as we do Murdoch above. Any gorillas fans on here? Reticulated pythons, kind of like false water cobras, seem to be a smarter species of snake. Like, they intellectually seem to be with it more than other species, like corn snakes. And you can also see they're very active snakes, and they love to climb. However, they get much too big for a lot of reptile keepers, so if you want to retic, I suggest getting something like a super dwarf mutation that actually stays smaller as an adult. Ugh. Yeah, really. You are too active. I'm oh. gonna put you back. Well, that concludes all the animals on this level of the house, which means we only have one level left, and you know what animals are down there. And we're gonna, of course, make you wait for the largest animal down here for last. But in the meantime, snake on a stick. These are our green tree pythons. I have two of them out with me right now. This is a female sarong locale. And uh, she is our newest green tree python, actually. She was purchased, or we purchased her from somebody who just couldn't take care of her anymore. She's captive bred, and she's gorgeous. She's actually handleable, too, which is great. Unless she's in food mode. She can be a little bit testy when it comes to food. But that's just kind of green trees in a nutshell for you. Over here is the Biak locale. He was the red one we unboxed in our green tree python unboxing video. Well, Check he's actually shedding. Oh, that's right. During that video, he was actually shedding. And many sheds later, he turned from red to yellow, and now he's turning from yellow to green. And eventually, he will be as bright green as the other one you just saw, who's now on Ed because she was being a little bit too, uh, too difficult for me to, to juggle with this one. This is another sarong locale. The reason why his perch is brown is because we've recently been trying out a new substrate for these guys. We've been trying out a coconut fiber, and the, the, it's great to hold the humidity. However, this is our one green tree python that likes to explore at night, and he is moving all around his enclosure. So that means he drags the brown coloration um, from the bedding to his perch, and he wipes it all over the perch. As you can see, 
White, he doesn't explore the bottom of his enclosure, and brown, he certainly does. You can also see some of the brown staining from the substrate on him, like a little bit right there. It's not bad for him at all, it just makes his scales look a little bit discolored. But I mean, he's having fun, he's enjoying cruising around and exploring, I guess, so it's no harm to him. And then the last green tree that I have out with me right now is another locale, and I want to hold them all next to each other. Oh. Two seconds, we're gonna put somebody back. <laughs> Say goodbye. Alright, so the sarong has been put back since she is the most active, but she's a sweetheart, so it's okay. These three, however, are still sleeping. It's daytime, so we took advantage and took them out during the day. The one on the left here is the Meraki locale, and they're known for kind of that lime green coloration on their sides. Beautiful snake, and very sleek looking. I love her kind of lack of pattern, actually. The one in the middle is one of these sarongs, and they are known for the blue coloration down their backs and kind of uh, scattered blue spots throughout their body as well. And the one on the far right is the Biak locale, or Biak, Biak. And the Biaks have the widest variety of colors as adults. Some may maintain a bit of the yellow, some may have kind of a darker green dorsal stripe, some may show patterns, some may not. It really just depends. You never know what you're going to get when you raise a baby Biak. Another cool thing about green tree pythons is, although they're called green tree pythons and they are green as adults, they aren't green as babies. When they first hatch from their eggs, they are bright yellow or bright red. There's also some that are maroon or even almost black I've seen, but they all turn green as adults. Some breeders are actually working with green tree pythons to try to get adults that stay with their old baby colors. And there's actually a line bred um, coloration called the canary yellow green trees, which hang on to their yellow coloration as adults. But that's not genetic, it's just a line bred trait. Another really cool thing about green tree pythons is the end of their tail is very skinny and it's very dark. That's because these snakes exhibit a behavior called caudal luring. Caudal means tail, and luring means to lure in, which for these guys, they're luring in prey items. And they'll actually take their tail and they wiggle it around near them. And when a mouse walks by thinking it's a worm that they get to eat, the green tree python will reach out and grab whatever animal it is that's interested in their tail. After catching their prey, the green tree python will constrict it and they will eat while still hanging in their branch. We have a couple videos that show our green tree pythons eating and they almost use, or they do use gravity. They hold their mouth upwards and gravity kind of helps guide the food down their throat. For a color and size comparison, here is one of our adult BX. This is uh, Dolores, actually. Yeah, Dolores? Dolores. Yeah, Kirill is still in the... Uh, this is Dolores. The, she, as you can see, maintains some white flecks. And again, BX are kind of unpredictable when it comes to their adult colors. So she ended up being a really pretty adult. I mean, they're all pretty. But you can see, he'll, he'll turn into something like similar to her, or maybe a little bit different. He'll be green um, for his main color, but who knows what his flex or any remaining pattern will look like. Although these snakes are beautiful animals, they are, especially the Biak locales, are not very handleable. I mean, if you get a captive bred green tree python, they are generally a lot better at handling like that sarong female I had out earlier. But these two were farm raised, so they're a little bit more unpredictable. They also have very fragile bones and ribs, so you have to be careful when you're handling them so that you do not injure the snake. And it's really just a good species of snake to leave as a display animal rather than one that you hold on a regular basis. As long as you watch their behavior, you can avoid any bites, really. Um, you just have to know how to read their body language. We have two more uh, adult-sized Biak green tree pythons in the closet behind me. It's a heated closet for them, so it's nice and toasty warm for them. It's also our incubation room. It's where we incubate all of our eggs. Unfortunately, it's really dark back there, and we can't get this light to uh, fit back there and make it look good. Plus, um, those other two green trees are wide awake right now, so there's no chance we'd be able to take them out without getting bit. Ed would prefer not to get bit today. So, we're just going to end our green tree python tour here, and maybe we'll do a more in-depth one at a later date. Behind me, in case you haven't seen them already, are our turtles. I won't spend much time on them because we just did a video on our turtles like a week ago, but this is a soft shell turtle, we have a painted turtle up here, we have a map turtle over here, and down here are a, this is Mitchell, our newest rescue. He's a little painted turtle with some um, shell deformities due to lack of UVB in his previous home. 
And over here we have one of our three stink pots or musk turtles. We feed them a variety of different brands of pellets so they kind of have a variety of nutrients in their diet. There's some sinking ones for the stink pots, although they seem to prefer catching the ones as they float above their heads. So, okay, that works. It's a little foraging challenge for them, I guess. Up above, we have a foraging toy. And this makes them kind of work to get their food, so it provides them a little bit of enrichment. You just set it down, and they have to bat it around to get the food to come out. That's over here. Come here. Quit following my hands. There you go. Oh, and then our soft shell. Soft shell's name is Taco. He just sneaks up and grabs the food in front of their faces, but... All right. Here's the thing that everybody commented about. What? What was Taco's name oh. before? Okay, so Taco's name used to be Pancake, and then I learned that there's another YouTuber out there that named his soft shell Pancake, and I have no idea. But I didn't want to seem like I was copying his idea, plus the name suggestion of Taco came around, so we switched it to Taco. So yes, this is originally Pancake, but now he's the soft shell Taco. While we're feeding turtles, I think I'm just going to feed our, that's going to go on the floor, I'm going to feed our snapping turtle. This is Chloe, our common snapping turtle. Here's some food. You know, you love your pellets. We also like to give them live fish to hunt down for enrichment, and she'll sometimes eat mice when our snakes don't want to eat their rodent meals. But she's actually a pretty friendly snapping turtle. <laughs> Such a graceful grab. You know, she's so gentle. Oh, oh missed. you missed it. Come on. There you go. Get that one too. Yeah. <laughs> I bring her to programs. She's actually so friendly, I can bring her to, to schools and such. But, um,. I do use a head guard on her just to be safe, even though she doesn't snap. I still, for peace of mind, like to put the head guard on her. Honestly, the worst part about her are these back claws, and as she pushes, it can like break the skin. I might have to give you a nail trim, actually. We may have to do a nail trim. But she is stunted. She is older than you would think. I don't know exactly how old, but she should be much larger. She was kept in also too small of a tank. She was taken from the wild as a hatchling. It always kind of irks me when people say, I saved this baby turtle from the wild. You don't save a baby turtle from the wild, you take it from the wild, and she should have stayed in the wild. But she went through the local herpetological society as a rescue, and we decided that because of how friendly she is, we took her in, and now we use her as an ambassador animal as well. Oh, I guess she doesn't like her head touch today, though. All right, here you go. Now she does not, as you can see, does not have a basking platform. That's because snapping turtles are not a naturally basking species like all of these other turtles are. These turtles rely on being able to come out and bask in the sun and under the UVB and they outstretch their legs to kill all the bacteria on their feet. But snapping turtles spend the vast majority of their time in the water. They still do need UVB and it just shines through the water at them. That's what this lamp is for. That's for UVB. However, the only time they come out of the water is really when they're searching for a new body of water or laying their eggs. So she does not have a basking platform. In the summertime, we take all these turtles out and we actually let them bask in natural sunlight outside. We have them set up in kiddie pools with some rocks in the middle so they can stand in the middle of the rocks and really enjoy that fresh UVB because even with the best brands of UVB lights, we cannot exactly replicate what the sun produces. So the best lighting out there is natural lighting outside. So we make sure in the summer months they go outside and get some of that natural lighting. And finally, the animal you've all been waiting for, next to Chloe's enclosure, is Rex's room. Rex, he looks so unamused. <laughs> go away. You know what? The day this gets uploaded, Friday, March 1st, that's her 32nd birthday. Wow. Rex, happy birthday! Everyone should wish happy birthday to Rex in the comments. March 1st, you're 32 years old, girl. She's becoming an old, grumpy woman. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> Look at that face. Rex is surrounded by her favorite toys. She has her Kong Wobbler, which is the red toy. The yellow buoy is a buoy that was donated by Worthington Waterway Barriers. And near her tail is a tube. It's just extra tubing from the canister filters we use to clean our turtle tanks. But she likes to take them in her mouth and drag them around. And sometimes she'll even drown them in her pool, like that one. That's one of her victims. But her favorite toy in the world is this black dog food bowl. It's like one of those indestructible bowls we got from Ed's parents. Uh, I don't know who manufactures them, but Fleet that's... Farm. Fleet Farm? Mm -hmm. Perfect. There you go, Fleet Farm. 
That is her favorite toy in the world because I think she gets satisfaction in chewing on it and then killing it and she drowns it and we'll see it sunk in somewhere in her pool. Um, if you haven't heard Rex's stories, since there's so many new people on this channel, first off I would never recommend that anyone, including myself, get a pet alligator. Rex was taken from the Everglades as a little hatchling back in the 80s, and she was kept in a four-foot wooden box for the first 27 years of her life. She didn't have the right lighting, she was not fed properly, she was given one mouse every 10 to 14 days, and that was it. So not only was she stunted, but she was malnourished when we adopted her. I actually spent about six months convincing her owner that she needed more room, and finally he asked if we wanted to adopt her. And although we didn't want an alligator, we made it work just to get her out of that environment. So we renovated this guest bedroom for her. She has plenty of space now. She was only about three feet when we first adopted her, and she's about, she's about four feet now, so she has grown a foot, but we think that's about as much as she's going to grow. If anything, she's just gotten stronger and maybe girthier in more recent years. When we first rescued her, she could only take a few steps and then she'd have to sit down and rest. And in the water, she wasn't given a pool, and she was given a litter box about this big with like an inch of water in there. She couldn't hold her breath in the pool that we provided her, but now she like sleeps underwater. So she's come a long way. It's really rewarding to see how far she's come. She has a condition that's called a rubber drop, which is why her snout curves upwards. And that was caused by, as she was growing up in this box, she would hit her snout on the sides of it and it slowly deformed it. And because of uh, lack of vitamins and nutrients in her diet, the bones were they were soft and they were rubbery, that's why it's called rubber jaw. So they became deformed and stuck in that upwards position. It has gotten a lot better since we rescued her. I mean, it's straightened out considerably, but she'll never look like a normal alligator. You're fine, I'm showing them off your room. So she has in her basking area a daytime night and a nighttime light. The daytime is uh, one of the solar glows that's both heat and UVB. And that's what we had been using for quite a while, but we just recently, since she spent so much time in her pool, we recently hooked up a pure UVB lamp for her, so she gets plenty of UVB. Whichever one she's at, there's UVB shining down on her. And her pool here is actually filtered by a canister filter that sucks up the water here, and she will actually break all these tubes unless we have it caged away. Like, we've learned from experience, things will break and she will bite them unless they're completely barricaded. But the pump in here, in my old bike basket, will suck up the water, push it through this filter, which then cleans the water and strains out any gunk or any debris, and then pushes the water through a heater that's in that PVC tube, which was accidentally left on without the pump running one night, and now it's scarred. So that's what that brown mark is for. Anyway, the water gets warmed up in there and pushed into Chloe's tank. Hi, Chloe. And then when the water reaches the strainer level, it, which it just maintains a water level this high, it drains from the strainers back into Rex's pool and the whole cycle starts again. Um, over here, we have her cave. She doesn't really use her cave anymore. She used to when we first got her. And then behind the cave is her poop corner. Rex, you pooped. You pooped Italy, it looks like. Can you poop countries now? That's your newest trick. Yeah, apparently. Well, that covers everything in our house, except for the animals that are still in brumation. So we will plan on doing a 2019 breeding plans video once those animals have warmed back up and are, uh, we, we kind of have a better idea of what we're hoping to produce this season. But we're just going to end it with these cute little lovebirds. This is, this is the pair of albino checkered garter snakes. Let us know which one was your favorite out of all the animals in our house from part one to part two of our reptile house tour. Let us know which animal is your absolute favorite in the comments below. We're always curious. We always want to know which ones you like. Thank you again for helping us reach 1 million subscribers. I still can't believe that we made it, but here we are. Thank you to not only our subscribers, but our Patreon supporters too for backing this channel and everyone who's just watching this video. Thank you so much for your support and we'll see you next time. Got what we think hit by a lawnmower. This is our false water, almost a chameleon. So I am editing this part two and I keep hearing thumping noises coming from Ed, or Ed's, Rex's room. So I'm kind of nervous.
Rex, what are you up to? Rex? Where are you? Are you in your corner? You're not in the... I heard hissing. <gasps> You're in your cave? You never use your cave. What are you doing in there? I was going to feed you. I can't feed you when you're in your cave. You're just sitting in there and hissing. Are you trapped? Did you not mean to go in there? Are you stuck? It's a piece of plastic, Rex. You can lift it up. Well, I was going to tell everyone that alligators are the smartest type of reptile, but now I'm not so sure.